What up space fam, Golden here from Anime Uproar and today I'm very excited to talk about the backstories of all of the Hokage. I already did a video describing the role of the Hokage and each Hokage's powers, so feel free to check that out if you're interested in that, I'll link it in the description, but here I'll be focusing on their actual lives rather than on their powers. I made a similar video for all the Yonko in One Piece and I really enjoyed that too. I love seeing how legendary characters came to be, what their roots were. I always find these backstories interesting and inspiring and I hope you will too. If you do enjoy these Naruto videos and want to keep them coming the best you could do is smash that like button until it changes colors. If we can get 6,000 likes on this video I will get started on the next Naruto video ASAP. Then after the like button has changed colors you can leave a suggestion for me in the comments for what Naruto video you would like to see next. If you haven't be sure to subscribe and this is crucial hit that notification bell and select all or you will miss future Naruto videos. Videos. And while you wait for your dream topic to get covered, feel free to check out my growing Naruto playlist which includes videos on all the Uzumaki, all the Otsutsuki, all the Kage, and much more. Link to that is in the description. Now without further ado, let's jump into it, spoilers and all. First of all, we have Hashirama Senju. The very first Hokage and the man who was referred to as the God of Shinobi. Hashirama was born to Butsuma of the Senju clan during the Warring States period. The Warring States period came before the formation of the Hidden Villages and was characterized by war and violence. Hashirama was the eldest of four brothers. During this period, the extremely powerful Senju and Uchiha clans were constantly waging war against each other and a young Hashirama and his brothers participated in these battles. When kid Hashirama wasn't fighting in wars, he would sometimes skip stones across a river. During one of these downtime moments, he met a kid around his age. From the get-go, Hashirama was more talented than this kid, which was evident in his superior stone skipping skills. The kid was irritated that Hashirama, his stone skipping rival, was ahead of him. The two would go on to become friends and then deadly rivals, but this dynamic between talented Hashirama Senju and the frustrated Madara Uchiha would remain largely unchanged. The two kids didn't give their family names to each other and so they could be friends without allowing their warring clans to get in the way, at least for the time being. Hashirama had quite the sense of humor, once when he was bragging about being better at skipping stones than Madara, an irritated Madara asked Hashirama if he wanted Madara to skip him instead of a stone. After apologizing, kid Hashirama with a grin said he just hopes he reaches the opposite shore, clearly poking fun at Madara's inability to skip stones all the way to the other side. I laugh out loud every time I read this part and I really like seeing these legendary figures having fun and making jokes. It was not long until their idyllic childhood friendship was interrupted by a shinobi body floating down the river. Hashirama ran on top of the water and seeing that the body was wearing a Hagoromo clan crest, he cut the meeting short. Before he left though, Madara offered only his first name too, stating that not preferring one's family name to a stranger is shinobi law. Thus, they they both now knew that the other was a shinobi too. Later Hashirama's little brother died at only 7 years old during a battle against Uchiha and Hagoromo clans. His other little brother Itama was crying and their father told them and I quote, if you're a shinobi do not grieve. Shinobi are born into this world to fight and die in battle, end quote. That gives you a sense of what Hashirama's father was like. Hashirama even from this young age hated the killing and conflict and asked how long these conflicts were going to last and his father responded until the very last foe has been vanquished. Hashirama was not satisfied and asked if children had to be sacrificed. His father got very mad at this point and punched him in the face. The father felt like Hashirama was disrespecting his fallen brother by calling him a kid and insisted that he fought and died as a full-fledged shinobi. So that gives you a sense of the kind of times they were living in. Seven-year-olds weren't allowed the luxury of being thought of as children and for even questioning the constant conflicts, you could get a knuckle sandwich right to the face. Hashirama, even as a kid, was quite the critical thinker and visionary. He realized that the fact that the Senju were called the Clan of Love was a joke at this point. The adults ganged up on the kids and drove them to die in battle. There was so much fighting and death that he said he couldn't even keep track of all the grudges anymore. He proclaimed to his father that this shinobi world is totally messed up. Tobirama helped calm the father and son down, but you can already see Hashirama's philosophy taking root at this age. He didn't create a perfect world, but he would definitely go on to pave the way for a less messed up one. 
During the era of warring states, the average life expectancy of both shinobi and citizens was only about 30 years, and we're told what kept it so low was the death of many young children. Itama, another younger brother of Hashirama, would go on to die in battle as well. Hashirama went to the river to grieve because all the haziness of his heart would get washed away as he stared at the water. Madara saw him there and they bonded over the fact that they'd both lost brothers in battle. Madara understood that since they're shinobi, they never knew when they might die. At this point, Madara already felt like neither side having to die was an impossibility. But he reveals that he's always putting out a wish when he's here that there is a peaceful way, where both sides revealed their bellies and hid nothing from each other, and poured each other drinks and drank together like brothers. Hashirama was glad to find a kindred spirit in Madara, another foolish kid who thought of changing this war-torn era. At this point, Hashirama considered Madara a gift from the divine. Hashirama and Madara kept meeting up from time to time, and they began sparring, comparing their shinobi moves, and even talking about the future. Interestingly enough, they would get draws at this point. As they thought about their vision for the future, Madara told Hashirama that the first steps are to not give up on their ideals and to get a lot stronger because weak pups barking won't change a thing. This is a great quote by Madara and Hashirama agreed, saying that if they mastered all sorts of jutsu and got stronger, the adults wouldn't be able to ignore them. Hashirama and Madara grew closer to each other every time they met up. During one meeting where Hashirama beat Madara in a race to the top of the cliff by cheating and starting first, Madara almost revealed that he had the Sharingan, and then went on to to say that he only had one brother left out of four. He promised that he would protect this younger brother no matter what. Hashirama spoke of building a settlement where they were, where kids wouldn't have to kill each other. He dreamed of schools where kids could train, of missions fit to an individual's abilities. But the recurring pattern here is that he wanted a place where kids didn't have to be sent into deadly battlefields. Although Madara called this dream nonsense at first, he did admit that in such a place, he could watch over and protect his little brother. Other, and the two smiled together. And sure enough, that was the place where Konoha would eventually stand, and on that day, Hashirama made a resolution to endure for the sake of his vision. The fox and the hound-like relationship couldn't continue for long though, because Hashirama's father confronted his son and told him that the kid he was meeting up with was part of the Uchiha clan, their mortal enemies. His father called Madara a shinobi genius who has taken down adults of their clan. Hashirama actually figured as much and was notably not too surprised by his father's words. This friendship that they had formed was now unraveling as Hashirama's father was telling him to spy on his friend, to bring intel about the Uchiha, and to kill Madara if he gets suspicious. And so, once again, the adult world encroaches on the kids. One fateful day, Tobirama and father Senju follow Hashirama when he goes to meet Madara. The two skip stones to each other, and on those stones they've let each other know that a trap is being set up for them by their rival clans. As both make excuses for leaving, their families have different plans and confront each other. We got Hashirama's dad and only remaining younger brother versus Madara's dad and only remaining younger brother. Hashirama's dad, Butsuma, and Madara's dad, Tajima, knew from many past encounters that they had about equal strength. So it came down to the little brothers, Tobirama and Izuna. As we're told, shinobi are trained to keep their hearts in check on the battlefield no matter matter what happens, since a single flash of emotional disarray can lead to vulnerability and mean the difference between life and death. And the two fathers knew if they saw their own child killed, it would unbalance their heart and probably ensure the opponent's victory. Hashirama and Madara begged them to stop fighting, but the hatred and animosity between the clans was too strong, and they paid no attention to their pleas. The fathers tried to kill each other's youngest living sons, but Hashirama and Madara used the stones in their hands to repel the attack. Finally, Madara getting defensive over his brother says that maybe their pipe dream of a peaceful ninja community just isn't possible. Madara lets his father know that Hashirama is stronger than him and so do Chiha's retreat. Because Hashirama is a Senju and Madara lost his brothers to Senju, he says their next meeting will be on the battlefield. This is a truly powerful and sad moment where the kids can no longer avoid being corrupted by the adult world. At this point, Madara fully awakened his Sharingan eye because he decided to completely erase his friendship with Hashirama. Hashirama and Madara would go on to fight each other many times and each became the leader of their respective clans. Hashirama though had never abandoned their dream and in one instance, after flexing the fact that Madara couldn't beat him, he suggested they end the fighting. 
fighting. The Senju and Uchiha were considered the strongest shinobi clans, so if they joined forces, eventually nations would not be able to find other clans that could stand against them, and the conflict would die down. Madara was listening, but his little brother, who was wounded by Tobirama, told him not to be deceived, and so Madara left the battlefield. At this point, the Uchiha knew they were in an unfavorable position, and there were defectors who joined forces with the Senju. Who knows what might have happened if Madara's sole surviving brother lived, but he didn't. He died from the wounds. Madara obtained the eternal Mangekyo Sharingan, which he planned to use to help protect the Uchiha. Hashirama kept talking about ceasefire agreements and ended the fighting, but Madara wanted to fight, thinking peace was impossible. They battled for a whole day and Hashirama again came out on top. Tobirama was ready to kill Madara, but Hashirama stopped him and forbade anyone to touch him. Madara was pretty understanding of the situation and even said it would be okay to die by Hashirama's hand. It would be an honor in fact. Hashirama's goal was always peace and so he asked if they could skip stones again like in olden times. Madara though couldn't agree to this since he lost all his brothers and couldn't trust Hashirama. However, he said that one way to show each other their guts was for Hashirama to kill his brother or himself, to make it even. At that point, Madara would be willing to trust the Sanju clan. I gotta say, I'd probably respond more like Tobirama in this situation, who said that Madara is crazy and Hashirama shouldn't listen to him. But Hashirama was an idealist who was always willing to sacrifice his life for peace. And so it wasn't that shocking when he decided to take his own life. He told Tobirama to make sure that the Uchiha and Sanju never fight again. Hashirama was arguably too much of an idealist, and for him to just trust that Madara and Tobirama would get along after his death was pretty unrealistic. But still, his trust in Madara was rewarded and Madara ended up stopping Hashirama's kunai. To Madara's credit, he said he'd seen enough. He'd seen Hashirama's guts and they came to an agreement. The dream was realized. Senju and Uchiha came together to build a village where hopefully no more children would have to be sacrificed. They joined hands with the Fire Country to create a peaceful nation that considered the country and the village to be on the same level. It it was during this hopeful period that Hashirama told Madara about the idea of the Hokage aka Fire Shadow, the head of Shinobi who would protect the country of fire from the shadows. It was the fire country that asked them to decide on the head of the village and Hashirama wanted Madara to become Konoha's first Hokage. Even though he didn't have any more brothers, Hashirama hoped that he could consider all the ninja in the village to be his family. At this point the Sarutobi clan and Shimura clan also wanted to become allies with the Senju and Uchiha clans. Everything seemed to be coming together. Believe it or not, during this conversation, it was Madara who, looking at the village through a hole in a leaf, came up with the name of Konoha, the village hidden behind the leaf. During these conversations, Hashirama and Madara thought over exactly what the Hokage would do, like staying in the village to watch over it, and Hashirama came up with the idea of carving Madara's face into the big stone, to symbolize how he'd protect the village. So we have Hashirama to thank for Hokage Mount Rushmore. Even as things looked hopeful, it was obvious that there were tensions, like between Tobirama and Madara. Tobirama told Hashirama that he couldn't decide who would be Hokage by himself and that Madara would never be chosen by the seniors. According to Tobirama, even though Uchiha acknowledged Hashirama as the true founder of the village. Tobirama also told Hashirama that the Sharingan becomes more powerful through hatred, so you never know what the Uchiha might do. Hashirama hated this discriminating talk and put a stop to it, but he was too late. And the leaf on the ground outside of the window implied that Madara had overheard Tobirama's words. When Tobirama said the village would be a democracy, Hashirama agreed and it was his face that was carved into the big stone instead of Madara's. As Hokage, Hashirama kept trying to get Madara on board and said he would be the second Hokage, but Madara knew that that title would go to Tobirama. You see here how Hashirama's idealism could make the situation worse. He spoke before he thought things through, and got Madara's hopes up only for them to be crushed later. After he pretty much told Madara he'd be Hokage, you can understand why Madara would be upset when Hashirama
Tobirama became the first Hokage. On top of that, he knew Tobirama and others like Tobirama didn't like or at least didn't trust Madara and Uchiha, and they were likely the future leaders of Konoha. If Tobirama were to take over, Madara felt like the Uchiha were going to be exterminated. So the pessimistic Madara had plenty of valid reasons to question Hashirama's optimism. But when he told his people to leave the village, not even one Uchiha listened to him. At this point, Madara's life was falling apart. He felt like he couldn't protect his clan, just like he couldn't protect his brothers. His own clan didn't trust him anymore, and that went double for the Senju. While Hashirama kept wanting him to be hopeful for the future and to give it time, Madara came to the conclusion that he should have ordered Tobirama's death that time he gave Hashirama the option to take his own life. Even though Hashirama called Madara his brother, Madara knew that if Hashirama had to sacrifice Tobirama or Madara himself for the village, Hashirama would choose to sacrifice Madara. Hashirama's silence seemed to prove Madara's point, so he left the village and decided to continue his fight against Hashirama in the village that seemingly betrayed him. It wasn't all bad news for Hashirama though. Even though he lost a friend, the rest of the world praised and imitated their village system, inspired by the fact that past rivals Uchiha and Senju joined forces. From Hashirama's perspective, his and Madara's childhood dream had come true. Kids didn't have to fight, their life expectancy went up, and they had time to learn and play. Nevertheless, Madara kept trying to destroy his previous dream. He kept on attacking Konoha and Hashirama kept beating him. Madara even tried to use a Susanoo covered nine tails to defeat Hashirama and it still didn't work showing just how insanely powerful the god of shinobi was. During their final battle, Hashirama stabbed Madara in the back with a sword and promised to take care of their village. As he was putting an end to their constant fighting, Hashirama told his childhood friend that, and I quote, anyone who tries to harm the village, whether they are his friends, siblings, or even his children, he won't forgive them. And so that was the end. Hashirama had changed. He was no longer the man who would continue to give Madara chance after chance to change. Hashirama's dream did bring about many benefits, but as he later acknowledged, the village wasn't perfect and it did eventually create the darkness that people like Itachi had to shoulder. A darkness that Madara arguably foresaw. In Hashirama's view, a shinobi is one who endures to achieve his goals. And Hashirama did exactly that. Yeah, he didn't achieve lasting peace, but he did the best he could. He would go on to have the nine tails sealed inside his wife Mito Uzumaki. In so doing, he secured that great power for Konoha. After Madara's defeat, things were more peaceful. Hashirama had children and notably a granddaughter called Tsunade, who would go on to become the fifth Hokage. The god of shinobi remarked and was amused by the fact that she inherited his love of gambling. During this time of peace, Hashirama also sealed away the secret manuscript that Naruto goes on to steal during the first chapter of the story because of how dangerous the techniques within were and because they were no longer needed in this safer world he had brought into fruition. Safer doesn't mean completely safe though, and conflict didn't disappear. At one point, Takigakure, the village hidden in the waterfall, would send future Akatsuki member Kakuzu to assassinate Hashirama. Hashirama defeated Kakuzu, but wars continued. Hashirama, ever the man wanting peace, staged a Gokage summit where he shared the tailed beasts he had caught with other Kage of the five great nations in an attempt to balance out the power and ensure peace. He was even willing to give them away for free, but Tobirama told him to shut it and that Konoha was selling them at a price. It's funny, even though Hashirama was physically stronger, Tobirama seemed to be the one more talented in affairs of the state, and he would usually tell his older brother how it had to be done. This first Gokage summit led to the end of minor conflict. Even at this first summit, there was plenty of arguing and even Hashirama didn't know how long the peace treaty would last. But he had a dream that a day would come when shinobi collaborate and help each other with one heart regardless of their affiliation. He considered this treaty the first step toward that dream and begged the other Kage to take that step with him. And sure enough, that day does come when five Kage have to rally around a greater enemy. But even though Hashirama didn't achieve what he wanted in his lifetime, I really like the way that he continued to work in the present in an attempt to create a better future for later generations. Just because you may not live long enough to see a tree at its prime doesn't mean that planting it today has no value. When Hashirama died, he passed on the title of Hokage to his advisor and brother Tobirama and told him over and over again not to mistreat the Uchiha. Unfortunately, we haven't gotten any satisfying explanation for how such a strong shinobi died 
side when Konoha was just beginning to flourish. It was during an unspecified conflict, but perhaps one day Kishimoto will give us the full story. Now the first Hokage's backstory was especially long because his is arguably the most important one since it contains the formation of the village and the creation of the title of Hokage itself. So I'll try to keep the rest shorter, especially because much of Tobirama's backstory was already contained within his brother's backstory. As mentioned, even from a young age, Tobirama supported Hashirama's idea of a new system that would get rid of wars through signed pacts, even if Tobirama was less idealistic about it than his older brother. On one occasion, Tobirama followed his father's orders and found out that his brother was secretly meeting with an Uchiha, and he participated in the already mentioned fight between the families before Hashirama and Madara managed a temporary ceasefire. In one of their future fights, Tobirama managed to mortally wound Izuna Uchiha, Madara's only surviving brother. In a future battle where Hashirama decisively defeated Madara, Tobirama wanted to finish him, but Hashirama stopped him. This was when Madara gave him the ultimatum, kill your brother or yourself, and Tobirama called him crazy, which makes sense. Why agree to such a ridiculous request from your utterly defeated opponent? Anyways, Hashirama didn't choose to take his brother's life, but his own, before Madara stopped him and agreed to work together. They found Konoha a place where kids can play and learn and don't have to die in battle. Tobirama was around the whole time as Hashirama's practical advisor, tempering Hashirama's unbridled optimism. He pointed out that Hashirama Hashirama couldn't decide that Madara would be Hokage all on his own, and that in this democracy the people would have to decide who the first leader of the village would be. Just as Tobirama expected, the people elected Hashirama to be the first Hokage. As mentioned, Tobirama was the one who ensured that the other villages actually paid for their OP-tailed beasts, whereas Hashirama just wanted to give them away for free. Tobirama trained and led a three-man team that included a young Hiruzen Sarutobi, who would go on to become the third Hokage. He he was also a genius when it came to creating techniques. He created many famous ones including the Shadow Clone technique and more infamously the Edo Tensei aka the Impure World Reincarnation technique that Orochimaru would go on to improve upon. After Hashirama defeated Madara the final time at the Valley of the End, Tobirama studied the corpse and the mysteries of the Sharingan, but rather than destroying Madara's body, he hid it deep within Konoha's mountains. After Hashirama died in an unspecified conflict, Tobirama inherited the title of the second Hokage and the command not to mistreat treat the Uchiha. Tobirama after all was always less trusting of the Uchiha clan because of the potential threat they posed to the village. And although it's widely thought that he hated the Uchiha, Tobirama defends himself by saying he simply treated any who posed a danger to the village, no matter what clan they belonged to, with extreme caution. However, he did respect some Uchiha like Kagami who put the village above their clan, which is what he wanted from everyone. Tobirama didn't just come up with amazing jutsus, he's also to thank for the academy, the anbu, and the chunin exams, all of which are integral parts of the village by the time the Naruto series begins. Additionally, it was Tobirama's idea for the Uchiha to run the Konoha military police force. Some, like Orochimaru, would go so far as to say that the rebellious Uchiha coup was at least in part the result of the creation of the police force. As Orochimaru explains, and I quote, those who crack down on crime tend to be easily disliked. Plus, the more authority such a group has, the more conceited it can get, end quote. Orochimaru added that by building the police station where he did, and shoving the Uchiha clan to the margins of the village, Tobirama helped foster Madara-like sentiments. Once again, Tobirama would defend himself by saying that the Uchiha were eminently qualified for that position. On the one hand, you could argue that it was Tobirama's way of honoring and showing his trust in the Uchiha. After all, you don't put those you don't trust in charge of enforcing the law. On the other hand, like Orochimaru pointed out, you could argue it marginalized the Uchiha and set them apart from everyone else, which inevitably hurt the quote-unquote village before the clan end goal. Like Hashirama, Tobirama worked on alliances and even even attended a ceremony to cement the alliance between Konoha and Kumogakure. Unfortunately, the Gold and Silver Brothers, known as the worst criminals in all of Kumo history, staged a coup attacking both Tobirama and the second Raikage. We're told they wielded the five treasured tools of the Sage of Six Paths and drove Tobirama to the brink of death. Tobirama survived this, but it would not be the last time he had trouble with Kumogakure Ninja. They really seem to be his kryptonite, which seems kind of fitting if you think about how he specializes in water-style jutsu, while Kumogakure Ninja are associated with lightning, like the 
Shirai Kage. Now to be clear, I'm speaking symbolically because Tobirama could actually use all nature transformations and he could definitely defeat the vast majority of lightning style users. But that doesn't change the fact that the gold and silver brothers from Kumo almost killed him once and Kumo Ninja would be the ones to finish him off too. During the first Shinobi War, Tobirama and his escort unit, which included Sarutobi, Danzo, Kagami Uchiha, and three others, was surrounded by 20 highly skilled enemy ninja. It was the Kinkaku unit. The group decided someone would have to act as the sacrificial lure and draw the enemy away so the others could escape. As Danzo was trembling and trying to talk himself into volunteering, Sarutobi beat him to it. However, Tobirama decided he himself would be the distraction. Before he left, he told Danzo to set aside his rivalry with Sarutobi. It was time for them to unite and work as comrades. He passed on the role of Hokage to Sarutobi and told him to love the village, to protect those who believe in him, and to develop those who would be able to protect the next era. We don't see the final battle, which kind of sucks, but it is implied that the 20 highly skilled Cloud Ninja were simply too much for him to handle. Some unofficial sources state that he was specifically killed by King Kaku of the Gold and Silver Brothers, but I couldn't find any satisfying proof of this. It's true that during chapter 529, Shikamaru states that King Kaku messed up the second Hokage, but that is likely referring to the aforementioned coup where Tobirama was brought to the brink of death. However, if I'm overlooking any relevant canon material, feel free to let me know and link it in the comments. The specifics of his death aside, it's clear that Tobirama brought a lot of value to Konoha, whether it was as a pragmatic advisor to his brother, as Hokage himself, as a creator of a shocking amount of amazing jutsu, or as the creator of famous institutions like the Academy. There is no doubt a dark side as well to his legacy, as some blame him for the fate of Douchiha, and some of his techniques would later be used against the village, like when Orochimaru used Edo Tensei to attack Konoha. Nevertheless, Tobirama played a huge role in shaping what Konoha became, arguably the biggest out of any Hokage, and it is not an understatement to say that the Konoha of Naruto's time would look completely different, perhaps even be unrecognizable, if not for Tobirama's influence. To get a sense of his influence, just take a second to try and imagine Naruto without Shadow Clones, or without the Academy, or without the Chunin exams. I could go on, but I think you get the idea. Now onto the third Hokage, the man who is Hokage when the story begins, Hiruzen Sarutobi. Hiruzen stands out even among Hokage and has been hailed as a shinobi god just like Hashirama. Interestingly enough, his father was named Sasuke Sarutobi, and Sasuke Uchiha's mother gave him that name, hoping he'd also grow up to be a strong, splendid shinobi. Both Tobirama and even Hashirama spent time teaching the talented Hiruzen. Through Tobirama's backstory, we figured out that Sarutobi was special, even compared to the talented Danzo, who was jealous of Sarutobi and viewed him as a rival. Not only was Sarutobi the first to offer to be the lure during the First Shinobi World War, he also noted that he was the most accomplished of the bunch, which is significant because this bunch was the second Hokage's elite team. Given his talent and his willingness to sacrifice himself for his team, it is not surprising that Tobirama picked Hiruzen to be the third Hokage. Hiruzen went on to marry Biwako Sarutobi and together they had a son and named him Asuma. Asuma would go on to become the charismatic leader of Team 10 and play Shogi with Shikamaru. Asuma also had at least one other sibling who joined the Anbu and gave Hiruzen a grandson in the form of Konohamaru. Hiruzen served as the team leader of the Sanin and even conducted the Bells test with Orochimaru, Tsunade, and Jiraiya when they were still young. Although Jiraiya complained that Hiruzen would always compliment Orochimaru over him, Hiruzen, a perv in his own right, was interested in joining Jiraiya when he went researching. Hiruzen was close to his students and was even there to comfort the orphaned Orochimaru when he visited the grave of his parents. Hiruzen would go on to lead Konoha through the second and third Great Ninja Wars. The anime focused more on the relationship between him and Danzo, where Hiruzen permitted Danzo to create Root, or the Foundation, a darker, more secret, and more merciless branch of the Anbu. Hiruzen overlooked Danzo's immoral actions even when they were targeted at the Hokage himself. After deciding to end the Third Great War by agreeing on a not-so-favorable peace with the village hidden in the stones, Hiruzen was pressured 
pressure to take responsibility for his actions by Danzo, and he did so by stepping down and having the fourth Hokage installed. Throughout Hiruzen's backstory, you can see the recurring idea of his softness, as Danzo calls it. Although he's strong, he's too forgiving to the detriment of the village and himself. Despite his initial hopes for his pupil Orochimaru, he knew that he couldn't select him to be the fourth Hokage because of his warped thinking, so he chose Jiraiya's disciple, Minato Namikaze, who had proved himself worthy during the Third Great War. Of course, Hiruzen continued to assist the village and advise Minato when he needed help. Hiruzen continued to have Anbu assigned to him, and when it came time for Minato's wife and the Nine Tails Jinchuriki Kushina Uzumaki to give birth to Naruto, it was Hiruzen who let them know that she'd give birth inside a barrier away from the village and that his Anbu would serve as her guards. Notably, Hiruzen's wife Biwako accompanied Kushina, watched over her, and advised her during this period. Despite their efforts, thanks to Obito, the Nine Tails ended up in the village, and Hiruzen prepared to restrain the Nine Tails while telling the Anbu to protect the civilians. Hiruzen and the ninja of the village succeed in driving the Nine Tails out of the village as Minato fights Obito. Eventually, Minato joins them and teleports the Nine Tails away as Hiruzen watches from the sidelines. All he can do is watch because Kushina has erected a barrier, which keeps the Nine Tails from escaping, but also the third from coming in. Minato and Kushina sacrifice their lives and make their son the next Jinchuriki of the Nine Tails in order to save the village. We were told by Hiruzen as early as the second chapter that the the fourth wanted Naruto to be regarded as the savior of the village and a hero, since he was sacrificed in a sense for the safety of the village. However, Hiruzen points out that people didn't choose to see it that way. They viewed the Jinchuriki child with hatred, hostility, and even wished to deny his right to exist. So what could Hiruzen do? He decided to suppress as much information about the Nine Tails as possible, creating severe laws and penalties for any who disclosed the secret. Naruto was also given his mother's last name, so that Naruto wouldn't be targeted as the fourth son by enemies. As we know, Hiruzen's approach didn't really change the way people treated Naruto. He was still an outcast, and some Naruto fans continue to believe that Hiruzen could have done more to help change the public's view of Naruto. Moving on, it turned out that Hiruzen was right to trust his feelings about Orochimaru, because during one occasion it was discovered that Orochimaru was kidnapping ninja including Genin, Chunin, and even Anbu to experiment on. Orochimaru revealed to Hiruzen that in part he was experimenting with the art of immortality, a forbidden jutsu that can keep one's mind and soul anchored in this world for eternity. Hiruzen acknowledged that it was his indulgences that brought about this situation, and the following one where Orochimaru attacked the village a good deal after. During this instance, where he was confronting Orochimaru about the experiments, he admitted that he couldn't bring himself to kill his student, and he let him get away, a move that would end up hurting Konoha and sealing the third's own fate. One of Orochimaru's discovered experiments was Yamato aka Tenzo. Orochimaru had inserted Hashirama cells into 60 children, and most most didn't make it, but Yamato did and gained the ability to use the first Hokage's wood style. He would go on to become an exemplary shinobi even among the Anbu during the Third's rule and beyond. After the Nine Tails attack, people started to suspect that it might have been the fault of the Uchiha clan, because of the Sharingan's ability to control the Nine Tails. The Uchiha in turn were insulted and planned a coup. Itachi let the Third and his Konoha council know about the planned attack. Danzo wanted to strike with a surprise attack first, but Hiruzen considered the Uchiha his old comrades in arms and wanted to try to use words before violence. Danzo, without Hiruzen's approval, helped to convince Itachi to eliminate the Uchiha by presenting it as a way to avoid civil war and save his little brother Sasuke. After the Uchiha clan was wiped out, Hiruzen finally told Danzo that he can't allow him to act on his own authority anymore and formally dissolved his root organization. Hiruzen knew the truth about why Itachi did what he did, so when Itachi showed up and asked him to protect Sasuke against Danzo and the counselors, the third agreed and even said that Itachi could sneak into the village and check on Sasuke whenever he was worried about him. And although Hiruzen's story continues, that is it for the backstory portion. Like the second Hokage, there are definitely reasons you could criticize the third. He gave Danzo too many chances, he gave Orochimaru too many chances, and he arguably didn't do a good job of watching over Naruto and making sure that 
that he wasn't treated as an outcast. However, he had good intentions and he was ready to and did sacrifice himself for the village when the time came for him to do so. Although the first three Hokage were legendary fighters and did a lot of good, taking a look at their backstories reveals that they were still far from perfect. We've also seen that being a Hokage is a much harder job than you may have expected at first glance, and there is much more to it than just beating up strong bad guys. Next, we have Naruto's dad himself in Jiraiya's pupil, Minato Namikaze aka the fourth Hokage. Minato was lucky in the sense that during his rule, he could rely on the third whenever he needed to. Minato has been called the Yellow Flash because of his insane speed, and Jiraiya even thought that Minato might be the child of prophecy who would emerge as a savior of the world. Although this ended up being a better description of Minato's son Naruto, Minato did end up being the savior of Konoha and the savior of the savior of the world when he saved Naruto from Obito and the Ninetales. But let's go back to the beginning of his story. Minato met his future wife Kushina at the academy when they were both little kids. She had just transferred to Konoha. The first day she came, they had to tell the class what they wanted to be when they grew up. And Kushina actually yelled out that she was going to be the first female Hokage. This is even crazier than Kid Naruto doing the same thing because keep in mind, she had just transferred to the village and she was already saying that she'd be Hokage. The other kids thought she was snotty and so they called the round faced and red haired girl Tomato. She would then get angry and beat them up and then her nickname evolved to the red hot habanero. When it came to Minato, he said he wanted to become a great Hokage and he wanted everyone in the village to respect him. His Hokage rival Kushina mocked him and looked down on him thinking he was too girly and undependable until a certain incident. Years later, Kumogakure kidnapped Kushina because of her special chakra. All she could do was leave strands of her hair along the way. Minato was the only one who noticed her red hair and rescued her. He told her that he noticed her hair immediately because it was so pretty. After that day, Kushina stopped hating the color of her hair and realized that Minato would be a great ninja. Keep in mind, Minato was still pretty young and he beat multiple adult ninja who had a hostage. Not too shabby. Kushina began to view her red hair as the thing that brought her her love. She fell in love with her savior, Minato. As mentioned, Minato was part of Team Jiraiya, and Jiraiya saw his student as a rare genius. According to Jiraiya, Minato was kind and gentle, yet fierce and full of grit. He became the fourth Hokage in the blink of an eye, which seems fitting for Konoha's yellow flash. Danzo even tried to say he was too young for the job. Anyways, after Minato rescued Kushina, they became a couple. With the help of his love, Kushina was able to live and even enjoy her life as a Nine Tails Jinchuriki. As you may well know, during his life, Life, Minato created the Rasengan after observing a tailed beast ball. It took him three years, and his plan was to combine it with his own nature, but he didn't succeed before his death. What's crazy to think about is that Naruto was able to learn the Rasengan in like a month, if we include all of Jiraiya's different training stages, and eventually succeeded in combining his nature with the Rasengan to create the Wind Release Rasengan and then the S-ranked Wind Release Rasen Shuriken. So if Minato is a rare genius, what does that make his son? Obviously, it is easier to learn something when someone is teaching you than just coming up with the idea on your own. But still, you can't deny Naruto's impressive feats, and I like how he performs affected what his father started. Just as Minato was in Team Jiraiya, he eventually led Team Minato, which consisted of Kakashi Hatake, Obito Uchiha, and Rin Nohara. Minato was a star in the Third Great War, and his performance would eventually secure his position as the fourth Hokage. In one instance during the Third Great War, Minato took down 1,000 Iwagakure Shinobi on his own. Despite how impressive Minato was though, he couldn't be everywhere at once. He wasn't there when Obito went down, but he he did manage to come in time to save Kakashi and Rin. However, Rin was later kidnapped and forcefully turned into the Three Tails Jinchuriki and then decided to die by Kakashi's hand rather than enter Konoha as a Trojan horse. This was yet another instance where Minato wasn't present to protect his students and so only Kakashi remained. During the Third War, Minato ran to A who would eventually become the fourth Raikage on the battlefield along with B. Minato was faster and interestingly enough, he already knew that they'd both become Kage one day. Despite the fact that they were on opposing sides, there was clearly respect between these two legendary ninja. Minato went on to become the fourth Hokage, being chosen over Orochimaru. Kushina became pregnant and they decided to name the child Naruto after the main character in Jiraiya's first book, and thus they honored Minato's sensei 
and also made Jiraiya Naruto's godfather. And when you know that, the earlier parts of the series when Naruto and Jiraiya first meet and train together hit different. So let's look at October 10th, the night Naruto was born. Obito used the newborn Naruto as a hostage and used him to separate Minato from his Jinchuriki wife. While Minato was busy saving his newborn son from exploding tags, Obito extracted the Nine Tails from Kushina, taking advantage of the fact that the Nine Tails seal was weakened due to childbirth. Obito was impressed to see that Kushina as an Uzumaki was able to survive the extraction. He was about to let the Nine Tails finish her off, but Minato came in a flash and took her to safety where Naruto was. She hugged her baby as Minato went to take care of Hokage business. Obito took control of the Nine Tails and released it in the village. Minato appeared and teleported a Biju ball away in order to save Hokage Mount Rushmore. While the third and the others turned their attention to the Nine Tails, Obito confronted Minato. These two teleporters fought and Minato did extremely well. Even though Minato remarked that Obito's teleportation ninjutsu surpassed both his own and the second Hokage's, he nevertheless managed to hit Obito with a Rasengan and to release the Nine Tails from his control. After praising Minato, Obito retreated, but not before adding like a true villain that he'd rule the world someday. With one win under his belt, Minato turned to the Nine Tails. With Gamabunta's help, the fourth managed to teleport the Nine Tails to a safe distance, although it cost him so much chakra that Kushina had to be the one to erect a barrier around them. Kushina was prepared to take the Nine Tails with her to her death, but Minato didn't want that. Since Kushina wanted to see Naruto grown up, he took the rest of her chakra and sealed it inside Naruto so they could speak someday. Then he decided he'd use the Reaper Death Seal and seal half of the Nine Tails in himself and the other half in Naruto. Kushina argued with Minato wondering why Minato had to die, why Naruto had to become a Jinchuriki. But Minato saw this as the best option since it would let Kushina see grown up Naruto and help the village since the Biju balance wouldn't be upset and hopefully Naruto would be able to use the Nine Tails one day to stop Obito and to protect the village. Although they were both going to die for Naruto anyways, Minato and Kushina also used their bodies to protect their newborn child from Kurama's deadly claw. Before Minato sealed Kurama, a part of Kushina and a part of himself into Naruto, Kushina spoke with her child, telling him among other things to make a few friends he can trust, to not get depressed if things don't go well because everyone is good at some things and not so good at others, to make sure he has dreams and the confidence to make those dreams come true, and of course, she tells him that she loves him. And Minato not having much time left simply smiles and says ditto, and he seals their remaining chakra inside the newborn Naruto. And although Naruto admits later that he went through a lot as a Jinchuriki kid with no parents, he's happy when he hears about this backstory from his mother because he realizes that they always loved him. It's a moment that brings Kushina to tears, Naruto to tears, and yes, even me to tears. But for now, let's wipe those tears away and move on to the fifth Hokage's backstory. Tsunade, like Jiraiya and Orochimaru, was one of Konoha's Sanin, aka one of the legendary three ninja. She is the granddaughter of the first Hokage, Hashirama, and of the first Ninetales Jinchuriki, Mito Uzumaki, and thus contains both Senju and Uzumaki DNA, quite the OP genes in this one. In life, she earned the title not only of Hokage, but also of strongest female ninja and best medical ninja. But as usual, let's rewind things a bit. As mentioned, Tsunade was Hashirama's first ever granddaughter, so he spoiled her rotten to use his own words. The first Hokage also was very amused by the fact that she picked up his gambling habit. Tsunade inherited his necklace as well. As mentioned after the academy, Tsunade teamed up with Orochimaru and Jiraiya. They were led by Hiruzen Sarutobi himself. From their first meeting, Jiraiya flirted with Tsunade, telling her she could send her love letters to him later. And although he teased her before, calling her a tomboy and flat-chested, Tsunade did develop as did Jiraiya's interest in her. He clearly liked her enough to research her while she was bathing, and that led to Tsunade beating him up badly. According to Jiraiya, he was close to death, he got six broken ribs, broke both his arms, and had several ruptured organs. There were two figures in Tsunade's backstory who stood above the rest in importance, her little brother Nawaki and her lover Dan. They both wanted to become Hokage. On Nawaki's 12th birthday, Tsunade gave him their grandfather's necklace. She was optimistic and hoped 
he'd achieve his dreams. However, he died the very next day after receiving the necklace, and this was during the Second Great War. Clearly, children could still be casualties, despite Hashirama's wish to create a place safe for children. In this case, his very own grandson was a victim. Tsunade, now with her necklace back, realized it advocated that people like her brother Nawaki could have actually survived, or at least had a better chance of surviving, if every four-man team had at least one medical ninja. The third liked her idea, but also felt that they couldn't make that their priority in the middle of a war. Tsunade clearly disagreed, and a ninja named Dan took her side, believing that ninjas should learn from the past so people don't continue to die needlessly. Dan and Tsunade grew closer. Like Tsunade, Dan had lost a sibling, and like the first Hokage, he wanted to bring peace to this warring world. He wanted to become Hokage so he could protect the people of the village so they wouldn't end up like his sister. During the Second War, Tsunade they, alongside Jirai no Orochimaru faced off against the legendary Hanzo of Amegakure. It was during this fight, impressed by the three and how they survived the fierce battle, that Hanzo dubbed them the Sanin of Konoha. Additionally, Tsunade's medical expertise came in handy during the war when it came to counteracting the poisons that Chio of Sunagakure created. In fact, Tsunade was so good at creating antidotes immediately that it straight up embarrassed Chio, whose specialty was poisons. But despite contributing so much to the war effort, Tsunade couldn't save Dan. The seemingly cursed necklace struck again. Tsunade was touched by Dan's dream and wanted him to realize it, so she gave him the first Hokage's necklace, just like she gave it to her little brother before. And just like that time, Dan ended up dying on the battlefield, wearing the necklace. He was injured so badly that even though Tsunade was present, she couldn't save him with her medical ninjutsu. Dan resisted death, saying he couldn't die before he accomplished his dreams, so Tsunade played along, suggesting that he'd be fine. He died in the rain, and Tsunade, who had opened her heart once more to someone after she was hurt so badly by her brother's passing, had to suffer the same fate all over again. It was her inability to stop Dan's blood loss that led to her developing blood phobia. She had understandably become traumatized and pessimistic about people's dreams. And so Tsunade got her necklace back yet again. After the war, she left Konoha with Shizune, Dan's niece. She trained her and Shizune ended up becoming her apprentice. The broken Tsunade retired from medicine and combat and spent her days gambling, or more accurately, losing at gambling. She was known as the legendary sucker because she lost so much. Eventually, Naruto would show up and help knock Tsunade out of her funk, but that is a topic for another video. For now, let's move on to the sixth Hokage's backstory. Kakashi Hatake went on to inherit the title of Hokage from Tsunade after the Fourth Great War. We know Kakashi as the copy ninja, as Kakashi of the Sharingan, as the leader of Team 7, and of course as the sixth Hokage. But let's take a look at how this legend got started. Kakashi was the son of Sakumo Hatake, and his mother died when he was very young. Sakumo was a powerful and famous ninja himself, renowned as Konoha's White Fang. Minato even said that during Sakumo's time, the Sanin paled in comparison to him. During an important mission, Sakumo decided to put the lives of his cell members ahead of the mission, which is a no-go in the ninja world. As a result, he was vilified and blamed for the great deal of damage that resulted from abandoning the mission. Even the people he saved slandered him. Eventually, this dishonor and rejection was too much for his body and soul to take, and he took his own life. At that point, Kid Kakashi decided not to speak about his father and to devote himself to the laws and regulations of the village. It's a shame that the opinions of others affected Sakumo so negatively, especially because he was a likable character. When Kid Kakashi was putting down Kid Might Guy for failing the academy entrance exam and for not being able to use ninjutsu, his father warned him not to slack off or at Might Guy's rate of training, he'll become stronger than Kakashi. Right away, Sakumo recognized Might Guy as a worthy rival to his son and hoped that they'd get along. And as Kakashi later realized, his father was completely right about Might Guy's insane level of potential. In the academy, Kakashi earned top grades and was recognized as an elite genius, the best of his generation. He graduated from the academy in one year at the age of five. As mentioned, he was teamed up with Obito and Rin under the leadership of Minato. Just like 
like Hiruzen gave a bell test, so did Minato, and so with Kakashi as we well know. Kakashi beat my guy during the exam and became a Chunin at 6 years old. The best way to describe early Kakashi is that he was insanely talented and excelled on paper, but he was haunted by his father's death and that led to him considerably downplaying the importance of teamwork and friendship. During the Third Great War, Kakashi had been promoted to Jonin and Minato left him in charge during one mission while he went to fight on the front lines. Their goal was an infiltration mission to destroy the enemy supply bridge and evacuate. During this mission, Kakashi used Chidori for the first time on the battlefield, but he ended up having to be saved by Minato, who told the young Kakashi not to use it anymore because although it has speed and destructive power, it makes him move too fast at a point he can't ascertain the opponent's counter attack. It would not be a perfected jutsu until he inherited his Sharingan eye from Obito, the power of which could eliminate its vulnerability. Minato then left them telling them that the one thing important above all else is teamwork. Kakashi, Obito, and Rin went on to work on their mission. Rin was kidnapped by Iwagaku Reishinobi, and Obito wanted to go after her right away, but as usual, Kakashi wanted to prioritize completing their mission, since that's what the law dictated. The two argued, and Kakashi told Obito that emotion was just a useless burden. Obito had had enough and decided that he'd disobey orders and go save Rin. Kakashi warned him about the consequences for breaking rules. Obito said that he knew them and he was gonna go through with it anyways, and he added that that's why the White Fang, aka Kakashi's father, was a true hero. This is an epic moment for Obito and his words stay with Kakashi. He tells Kakashi and I quote, Those that break the rules and regulations are scum, but those who abandon their comrades are worse than scum. If I'm going to be called scum either way, I'd rather break the rules. And if that's not being a proper shinobi, then I'll destroy that idea." End quote. Although the two walk off in different directions, my heart does smile when Kakashi eventually comes back and joins Obito. The enemies can't help but think of the white fang of Konoha when they see Kakashi's white hair and his light blade in action. While protecting Obito, Kakashi loses his left eye. Although Obito can only cry at first for being a useless burden, he he does recover and actually awakens his Sharingan. He uses his newfound power to locate and defeat the camouflage using Ninja. They manage to rescue Rin, but during the escape, Obito saves Kakashi by hitting the ladder to safety as he gets crushed by a falling boulder in his stead. As Obito is dying, Kakashi blames himself, thinking if only he came with Obito from the start, none of this would have happened. Obito just smiles though, saying that he forgot to give Kakashi a gift for becoming a Joni, and so he offers his shutting an eye to him. Not only that, Obito tells Kakashi that he's a great Joni. I like how Obito frames this as well, saying that he'll become Kakashi's eye and they'll see what happens in the future. So even though he'll be gone, Kakashi will always carry a part of him. Kakashi uses his new Sharingan to defeat the remaining enemy using his perfected Chidori that he can now use to the fullest thanks to the perceptive powers of the Sharingan. The enemy forces keep on coming, but now Kakashi can use his perfected Chidori to keep his promise to Obito and protect the Rin with his life. Kakashi tells Rin that Obito loved her and that he gave his life to protect her, but she tries to confess her own love for Kakashi, only to have Kakashi reveal that he was ready to desert her. Fortunately, Minato showed up and defeated all the enemies before Kakashi had to sacrifice his own life too. Minato then apologizes for not coming in time to save Obito. We're told that two heroes were born on that day, both of which possessed one Sharingan. One was Obito, who had his name engraved on a memorial stone, and the other came to be known as Kakashi of the Sharingan. We're told that tales of Kakashi's bravery spanned all borders and beyond. At a later date, Rin got kidnapped by Kirigakure and forced to become the Three Tails Jinchuriki. Kakashi succeeded in getting her out of Kirigakure, but that was actually their plan, to get Rin into the Hidden Leaf Village and then for the Three Tails to attack the village. Rin knew about this, so when Kakashi was using his Lightning Blade, aka Lightning Cut, to fight enemy ninja, she threw herself in front of it. In the end, she chose to die at the hands of someone she loved in order to protect Konoha. As a side note, Kakashi's Chidori was renamed Lightning Blade because it was said that he perfected it to the point where he was able to split a bolt of lightning with it. Killing Rin was never an option for Kakashi. He had promised Obito to protect her and he was determined to find another way. He wasn't going to lose Rin like he lost Obito. So you can bet that Kakashi was traumatized when Rin died by his 
hand, and that traumatic event awakened his Mangekyo Sharingan. Kakashi then passed out, but what he didn't know was Obito had survived his wounds and was actually watching as Rin, the girl he loved, died. His remaining Sharingan, like Kakashi's, evolved into a Mangekyo Sharingan, and he went on to kill all the surrounding enemy ninja while Kakashi laid on the floor unconscious. Not surprisingly, Kakashi was depressed after all of this happened. He'd lost his mom and dad when he was still young. And then, as far as he knew, Obito died because of him, and not only did he fail to keep his promise to Obito by saving Rin, she even died by his hand. And yet, after all this suffering, he somehow survived without knowing why or how, despite being surrounded by countless enemy ninja before he passed out. In the anime, people even called him friend killer Kakashi because they thought he purposely killed Rin so she wouldn't leak information. Knowing how negative opinions influence his father, we can assume that this kind of talk didn't make Kakashi feel any better. Ironically, once Kakashi finally realized the importance of prioritizing the lives of his comrades, people now started to believe that he wouldn't hesitate to kill a comrade for the sake of a mission. In the hopes that it would help with his depression, Minato Kakashi's old team leader and the new Hokage had him joined the Anbu and worked directly under him. In the anime, he was also assigned to watch over Kushina during her pregnancy since the third and fourth thought it might help him view life differently. It's cool to consider that he was watching over his future pupil Naruto all this time, and during his off time, he would visit the graves of Rin and Obito. During the Nine Tails attack, as a younger shinobi, Kakashi, along with my guy Kuranai, and so on, was kept away from the Nine Tails. The rationale was that since this was a domestic problem and not a war against the other villages, there was no need for the young generation to risk their lives. This is a bit random since enemy village or not, the Ninetales is still a threat to the village and Kakashi is clearly more skilled and useful than many adult ninja, but to be fair, I don't think there's much he could have done anyways since Minato and Kushina made sure to take care of the Ninetales alone, even keeping the third from helping. And as we know, Minato and Kushina died during this battle, which was yet another blow to Kakashi. Not only were his teammates gone, but now his leader and teacher as well, not to mention his wife, whom he watched over during her pregnancy. Minato was clearly the closest person he had left, so you can't help but feel bad for Kakashi here. It was the perfect time for Donzo to take advantage of the grieving Kakashi and get him to join the foundation. Although Donzo briefly held some sway over him and at some points it looked like Kakashi might have betrayed the third, this didn't last long. Kakashi actually told Hiruzen about one of Donzo's plans to assassinate him and help to thwart the plans. The fact that Hiruzen forgave Donzo here is ridiculous to me, but at least he did recognize Kakashi's potential and made him his right hand man. In the anime, after Hiruzen let Orochimaru escape, Kakashi confronted him but was paralyzed by the killing intent, aka bloodthirst, Orochimaru was exuding. We saw Sasuke similarly freeze up like this against Zabuza. It's quite remarkable that someone as skilled as Kakashi found himself in this position, and it goes to show the frightful power power of a Sanin. Danzo at one point sent Yamato, then called Kinoe, after Kakashi to assassinate him and to bring back his Sharingan eye. Kakashi ended up convincing the wood release user and former Orochimaru experiment that their friendship was more important than his mission, and eventually got the third Hokage to take Yamato out of the foundation. Once again, Hiruzen failed to punish Danzo after the latter attempted to have Kakashi assassinated. Keep in mind this is after he received a warning after trying to assassinate Hiruzen himself. Although I like Hiruzen, you have to admit that he was way too forgiving, especially if you take the anime-only moments into account. Kakashi led team Ro, an elite Anbu unit, serving directly under the Hokage. Yamato became part of this unit, as did Itachi for a time. Itachi eventually got promoted out of the unit, and when it got out that Itachi had murdered his clan, Kakashi, unaware of the entire truth, thought Itachi truly had become a villain, and wished that he'd done a better job of influencing him in the right direction. In the anime, we then see Hiruzen take Kakashi out of the Anbu, believing people with kind hearts did not belong in the organization. He was eventually put in charge of multiple teams, like Team 7, but did not think that these teams demonstrated the teamwork necessary to pass. It goes to show how far Kakashi had come since the days that Minato used to have to lecture to him about the importance of teamwork. 
And finally, that leads us to Kakashi's student and the seventh Hokage, Naruto Uzumaki. His backstory shouldn't be too long since he is our protagonist after all, and only a kid when our main story gets started. As we mentioned, Naruto was born on the night of October 10th to Kushina and Minato, the fourth Hokage. As we saw, they named him after one of Jiraiya's characters, and that made Jiraiya his godfather. So the bond between these two was very strong and cemented even before Jiraiya came to train him. On the night he was born, he was at one point taken hostage by Obito, and then he was made to be the next Nine Tails Jinchuriki as his parents sacrificed their lives to save him and the village. Quite a crazy first night of existence. Minato felt like Naruto would need the power of the Nine Tails down the line to fight the powerful Obito when he returned one day, although he didn't know this mysterious man was actually Obito at the time. Even from the first night, Minato was sure that Naruto was the child of prophecy, the chosen one who would save the world from catastrophe. As we saw, during Minato's backstory, he split the Nine Tails power in half. He placed the Yang part in Naruto and the Yin part within himself. It was too much power to all be sealed in an infant, but Naruto would be able to reunite with the Yin part down the line and unlock Kurama's full potential. Both of Naruto's parents died, but not before telling him how much they loved him. Naruto lived as an orphan and received monthly income from the village to pay for his necessities. I feel like Godfather Jiraiya could have stepped in to adopt him at some point, but hey, he probably had a lot of important things to do, including research. Naruto didn't know who his parents were, or that his clan name was changed to his mother's, so he wouldn't be targeted by his father's enemies. As mentioned before, Minato wanted people to regard Naruto as the hero of the village. After all, by taking the Nine Tails within himself, he saved the village from destruction. But that's not how people saw Naruto at all. Minato was way too hopeful. For starters, people didn't know the full story, like that Naruto was Minato's son. Furthermore, they took all the hatred that they had towards the Nine Tails, which caused so much destruction and death in the village, and directed it at Naruto, some even equating Naruto with the Nine Tails. This led to the orphan Naruto being ostracized, and since Hiruzen felt bad about that, he banned talk of the Nine Tails altogether. Still, the parents continued to dislike Naruto, and it makes sense that the effects of that would be passed down to their children, even if the children didn't know the complete truth truth behind those feelings. Naruto, growing up socially isolated and lonely, resorted to pulling pranks because bad attention was better than no attention. In the last Naruto the movie, we see how Naruto first met his future wife Hinata Hyuga when he enrolled in the academy. He defended her from bullies who were picking on her. Even at this early age, he was already saying he'd be the Hokage. They beat him up, but at least they did leave Hinata alone. In the end, Naruto let Hinata keep his red scarf that the bullies pretty much ruined. Naruto didn't necessarily think much of this incident. Standing up for Hinata, despite not knowing her, was the right thing to do. But for Hinata, she pretty much fell in love with her beat-up savior right there as she hugged his red scarf. I will add that down the line, she will later hand-knit another red scarf for Naruto to replace this old one, and I find that detail to be incredibly cute. But back to the academy where Iruka would become Naruto's sensei and become the closest thing to a father figure that Naruto had up to that point. Iruka may have hated the Ninetales, but unlike the others, he recognized Naruto as his own person and wanted the best for him. Naruto also wished to bond with Sasuke since he too was alone, having lost his entire clan. However, as we all know, Sasuke is hard to befriend and Naruto ended up being jealous of the Uchiha child because he was good at everything. Naruto began to view him as a rival, wanting to be cool and strong like him. Notably, Teuchi, the owner of the ramen restaurant in Konoha, and his daughter Ayame would welcome Naruto as their favorite customer. This may not seem like a big deal, but having people who welcome rather than shun you like everyone else in the village no doubt meant a lot to the young and lonely Naruto. And that pretty much brings us to the beginning of this epic tale that is the Naruto series. So there it is, every Hokage's backstory, aka what happened to them before the main story began. This will probably be one of my longest videos, if not the longest, so if you did enjoy it, be sure to show your love by smashing that like button until it changes colors. These videos take a bunch of time and energy to make, so like I said, I would really appreciate it if you hit that like button. If we can hit 6,000 likes, I repeat 6,000 
1000 likes, I'll get started on the next Naruto video ASAP. Just let me know what topic you would like to see next in the comments. I personally loved revisiting how these legends came to be and I truly found their stories inspiring and I hope you did as well. If you haven't, be sure to subscribe and this is crucial. Hit that notification bell and select all or you will miss future Naruto videos. And while you wait for your dream topic to get covered, feel free to check out my growing Naruto playlist which includes videos on all the Uzumaki, all the Otsutsuki, all the Kage and much more. Link to that is in the description. And I especially want to thank the Patreon squad over on Patreon and here on YouTube who help make videos like this one possible. First and foremost, I want to thank the patrons of Legend, the ones acknowledged by Lord Twigo himself, Alpha Sigma, and Red Haired Raven. And are the one tier patrons, the ones who stand atop all clans, Ingrata, Pate Heffa, Aljatal, Dr. Cortman, The Toasted Chi, Rai Carlo, Emperor Taku, Spidey Life Tanel, Tungsten Tarkis, and Cody Hebert. And our pro hero tier patrons, the one and only Gilgamesh, Angel Cruz, Anatoly Kazatsky, Cricket XP, Very Gucci, Alicia Actor, Bonnie Parks, Hinokami and Water, Ted No Ted, I Sparky 65, Joanne Garcia, Fatboy Games, Metal Mama, Corey McGowan, Deadly Saint, Soul Rise, Slice and Dice, and Pill You. Thank you all so much. If you do enjoy our work, you can support more of it by going over to patreon.com slash animeuproar and becoming a patron today for as little as $1. If you do so, you'll get your name featured in future videos alongside these amazing epic people right here. And you'll even get access to our private patron-only Discord where we talk about the latest chapters, the latest anime seasons, life, and of course, dank memes. So check out patreon.com slash animeuproar. Link in the description if you're interested. You can also join the YouTube channel by clicking Clicking that blue join button right next to the subscribe button that you've hopefully already destroyed so yeah you can support more content that way if you prefer whichever way you choose to support us you can get the same great benefits thanks again and until next time see ya space cowboys